No Sasquatch were harmed in the recording of this podcast. Hi, I'm Ryan White. I'm the Squatch Ranger. I like to investigate Bigfoot around Northeast Oklahoma and Southeast Oklahoma. Ryan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Oh, the honor is all mine to be sitting here talking to the actual Squatch Ranger. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I, I've, uh, I've, I've heard about your show, and I think we have a mutual friend, uh, Evans. Yes, yes, we do. And uh, he's he he speaks highly of you, and it's just an honor to to be a guest. I think very highly of him. And uh, he has spoke fondly of you. Um, I've actually watched your videos on YouTube over the years. Uh, you're an active poster of videos on YouTube. You like to post uh, videos of investigations and stuff and let people see what's going on. How did you come up with the concept of the Squatch Ranger? The concept of the Squatch Ranger. Well... I don't know if you're asking about the name or just the yeah, concept. Yeah, of, the name itself and the YouTube channel and everything. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the name, I actually wanted to, I wanted it to be Bigfoot Ranger, but I tried to make a Google email account, but somebody had already taken Bigfoot Ranger. So I was like, well, what's well, another way to go? Well, I, was, I thought, well, I'll, I'll use Squatch because that's – as far as I know, finding Bigfoot came up with that term, just Squatch or it's Squatchy. Maybe it came from somewhere else. I don't know. But anyway, I got that from finding Bigfoot. And so, oh, I'll use Squatch Ranger. And Ranger was like, hey, that it sounds cool to like, you're actually a ra- like a forest ranger, you're actually going out looking for Bigfoot. That's cool. Also, my college mascot was the Rangers. So that's kind of a double uh, hidden uh, little nugget of information there as well. That's awesome. I originally went by Oklahoma Squatch uh, okay. as my handle on the internet. Nice. Very so, nice. So let's just get this uh, <laughs> question out of the way. Okay. You have a Bigfoot costume. <laughs> yes. And, and you dress up as Bigfoot for events. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. So, yeah, that's kind of how I got started with everything. Um, with the whole Bigfoot research and investigations or whatever, I actually started out just doing birthday parties. Um, somebody once requested me to go out to like a teenager's campfire party on a weekend or something and kind of scare them or prank them or whatever. So, so I went out and did that. Someone hired me to do that. So I, yeah, I got this, how it all started was my wife was like, Hey, I saw this Bigfoot costume on the internet. Do you want to be a Bigfoot for Halloween? I was like, yes, that'd be awesome. Because I I've always talked about Bigfoot with her and, and, uh, she knew that I kind of just thought I like Mr. Mysteries and mysterious things. So she, she knew I liked Bigfoot. So she bought me the costume and it was like, as a grown man, it was the most fun, most fun Halloween I've ever had in my life dressing up as Bigfoot because everybody was like, Hey, can I take my picture with you? And, you know, it just it, it attracted a lot of attention. It was just a lot of fun. And I, I played it up and hammed it up and, and, uh, that's kind of out of my element. Cause I'm not really a, a showman or something like that. I'm kind of a shy person by nature, but when I have a costume on, I guess that's kind of a, a mask where I can, I feel like I can let loose a little bit more. And so anyway, that Halloween was a lot of fun. So so that that looked that led to the Bigfoot uh, birthday parties. If, if a little kid has a birthday theme, moms talk and they talk around. They're like, "Oh, I know who you can call," and they'll call me up and I'll I'll do that um, every once in a while. So um, and then one time I got on the internet and was talking to a, a lady from a different Bigfoot group in a different state, and we were going to collaborate and I don't know do some kind of podcast like we're doing right now or something and. And I said, here, go to my website. You can see what I'm all about. And so she read my website. And, well, it talks about my Bigfoot 
kind of business side business or whatever dressing up as bigfoot and she starts throwing out oh you're this isn't good this doesn't look good that you're a bigfoot researcher and you dress up in a bigfoot costume and all that and so i said no i'm not a hoaxer i you know this is just for kids parties this isn't hoaxing you know i'm i'm not gonna I'm not going to back down and like take all my stuff down off my website because I do kids birthday parties. So anyway, that's all our discussion that we probably don't need to get into, but I'm definitely not a hoaxer, but yes, I, I admit I dress up as Bigfoot in a costume and it's in good fun for kids birthday parties. Now you're not the Bigfoot that scared all those little kids in Oklahoma at the birthday party. Are you? No, no, I don't think that was me. No, no, no. The only people I've scared are like teenagers or above. Um, one time I actually did a bachelorette party. So that was, that was a lot of fun as Bigfoot. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, so I've done a few as a squatch ranger, you gotta be kind of flexible or, uh, what's the word? Just, um, you gotta be able to do a lot of different things. So, so anyway, that was fun doing the bachelorette party. Now, whenever you're watching uh, people submit Bigfoot photos and videos as evidence, uh, do costumes stand out to you because you're so used to seeing here? Because I know the costume that you have, and it's one that a lot of people use in their hoaxes. Right, yes. Um, you know, I, I'm, I've never just personally caught like a, a picture or video, and I just knew, oh, yeah, that's the costume that I wear, but you, you're correct. The one I have is probably the most basic general, <clears throat> general costume on the market. I, I, when I bought it or at the time, it was around a hundred dollars. Yeah. It's the most basic one that everybody gets. I actually did a YouTube video on this, um, where I actually posted a bunch of different, the most popular Bigfoot costumes on the market. And I, I included gorilla costumes too. And I kind of did a lineup and I said, Hey, this, I think this is a cool idea. Like if you're going to go out and investigate an eyewitness, put up, put a lineup of costumes that are like well-known in front of them and say, do what you see look like any of these? Cause then we can kind of, I mean, in a, in a sense, rule out a hoaxer because, you know, we're using a general public's uh, most popular costumes, but it's not every costume. I'm not saying that that's out there, but. But it's just kind of a, a tactic to go about because people can just always say, hey, uh, it was just hoax. They wore a costume, you know. Well, this is a way, like, to go to an eyewitness and say, look, here's some costumes right here. Take a look at this lineup like a, like a police officer would do a lineup. And a witness can be like, oh, yeah, that is what I saw. Or, oh, no, it didn't look anything like any of those. Are you kidding me? So I just thought it was an interesting way to go about it and think about it. That is, that's a really good idea. I haven't heard uh, anyone else uh, suggest that or say they were doing that. Yeah, and I actually had a some some gentleman on my YouTube. He he commented and said he was in law enforcement and he did lots of uh, lineups like that when he was in law enforcement. So that was that was good feedback to hear from someone who you know kind of appreciated uh, the the idea and the concept. And I kind of got it from watching finding Bigfoot out it was last year when I made the video and I was, I was going back watching some finding Bigfoot episodes and Renee, she's the skeptic on the show, you know, as you know, and oh, uh, she made some, some, some kind of comment about, well, you probably just saw someone in a costume. She was saying that to one of their witnesses. They were interviewing. I was like, well, we need to go, we need a way to like, you know, something to go about it. Just, just instead, instead of just saying, you just saw, you know, a, somebody in a costume actually have a lineup and be like, Hey, did you, did, you, did they happen to look anything like these? So, so why Bigfoot? Why, why, what got you interested? Like of all the things in the world <laughs> that you could do as a hobby, why choose Bigfoot? <laughs> well, my, my answer is long and boring and not interesting. Cause I've never, I never actually seen a Bigfoot. So, so it's not an exciting story like that that got me into it, but just, just watching, um, discovery channel as a teenager, I was like 15 years old or so at the time. And I believe the episode or the, the program that I was watching was Sasquatch legend meets science. Yeah. And that was, by the way, that's an awesome documentary. Very I, good I like, documentary. Yes. Yeah, so I was, I was just like channel surfing as a teenager and that, that popped up and, 
always, if I ever saw anything about Bigfoot or Loch Ness Monster or aliens, I was like always hooked as a teenager. I just liked mysteries and mysterious stuff, Egyptian pyramids, just all kinds of stuff like that in that category. So anyway, I saw that and uh, a couple of different things just really, you know, hook, hooked me. Dr. Meldrum showing the cast. And there's a guy on there, Jimmy Chilcutt, an FBI fingerprint expert. His whole testimony, I've talked about it before. That really was like really fascinated me that a guy from the FBI was like going to stake his whole reputation on saying my findings. I, I really do think there's something a hairy primate type walking North America. I would stake my reputation on it like that. Just like I was like, whoa, this guy works for the FBI and he's making like claims like this. There's got to be something to this. And I was instantly like open minded to everything that like they did like a segment in, on that about skeptics and stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like, what? what? How can you be skeptical of this? Like they they're showing all these casts. And I was just I was just totally into it. So watching that, like really piqued my interest. Then like years went by and like I kind of kept it in the back of my memory. And and then the Bigfoot costume more my, more my wife bought the Bigfoot costume. I did the Halloween thing. And then, and then I went to the Honubi Bigfoot festival as Bigfoot dressed up. I met some people there and then that kind of fast forwarded me into actually going out on camp outs, camp out weekends and looking for Bigfoot. So what's one of, uh, like, uh, the most memorable investigations that you've been on that you can think of? Do you have a favorite? Yeah, so the favorite one I have, probably the best day that I've ever had going out big footing as a term it, uh, was back in 2019. I was with Evans, Evans Bailey, and it was a North Canadian River Project group outing. We were supposed to go kayaking that day, and it was rainy all week and cold, and so the group made a group decision. We, don't, we do not want to go kayaking out in this raining, cold weather. So a few of us still wanted to do something. And so we decided, yeah, let's, let's go on a hike. So Evans kind of organized this little hike at Stinchcombe Wildlife Refuge in Oklahoma City. So instead of like uh, kayaking the North Canadian River, we were going to kind of walk trails through the, through the refuge and maybe up and down the banks of North Canadian River. So this was like in April, 2019. We, we went on like an all day hike. We were out for three or four hours anyway. It was raining the entire time, uh, not pouring, but it was lightly raining like the entire time we were out there. Very muddy. Like, um, it was just, we should have been able to make, you know, some footprints ourselves with our boots and stuff. Um, but we, we ended up finding a trackway and we, surprisingly, we couldn't make tracks sink in deeper than the tracks that were already there it it was kind of weird because we were in mud and it was raining anyway so that day we we did find like a trackway that was left and right feet we could see both the left and the right it was probably somewhere from a quarter of a mile to a half a mile long and we just kept finding the tracks finding the tracks we were actually following it backwards the of the direction it was actually walking because we were trying to go to the back of the park. So we were going the opposite way of the tracks, but we kept finding them, kept finding them. And, and I, and, you know, I had a video camera and I was recording and, and we, we ended up taking a measurement and it was like around 10 and a half, 10 to 10 and a half inches long. We, we, as humans, we just guessed without the ruler. We thought it was around eight inches is what we kind of thought. But then we measured, finally measured one. It was like 10 to 10 and a half. And so it was a little bit bigger than we thought. And we thought, well, maybe if this really is a Bigfoot, this is, might be a, a juvenile, you know, walking out here. Because we were we were thinking, okay, it's it's like 40 degrees. It's been raining all week, like kind of similar weather, similar, similar temperatures. Yes, someone could be walking out here barefoot. Yes, that is possible. But it's just very unlikely because of the circumstances of just being wet, rainy, cold. Like, who would want to walk that far barefoot? I get it if you go out and do a couple and then run back and put your shoes on, socks on, warm up. But to go that far, I don't know. I wouldn't want to do it. But, um, but yeah, we found those tracks. And then we were on our way back after finding all those tracks and, and recording and all that. 
we we're heading back and I did a wood knock. I, I carry these little percussion instruments called claves. They're kind of like really thick drumsticks. I guess you could think of them like that. And I always do like, like I call them simulated wood knocks. I just simulate a wood knock with these claves. So we were like at the back corner of the park getting ready to walk back. So I did a couple, we didn't hear anything. So then we're, we're just walking back. We're talking loudly. We're not trying to be quiet or anything. And then we hear a single wood knock, like when we're getting kind of close to the parking lot, like as we're leaving. And so we all stopped and we turned the camera on and I kind of whisper in the camera, Hey, we just heard a wood knock. Wow. Uh, I'm going to do a response. So I did a single one back on the claw base and I don't know, it was like 30 seconds and we got another single knock and it's, it's on camera. The audio is not very good, but it is on camera that would knock back. So that was probably the best day I've ever had Bigfooting because we got the wood knock and we found all those tracks. And we, t- we got pictures, we got some measurements, and that was just fun. It was just fun being out in the, the rain and stuff. And another another thing is, I don't know if you know what geocaching is. Yeah. But we went. Uh, we actually found a Bigfoot-themed geocache that was in Stinchcomb Park that day wow. in, the middle, in the middle of all that. So, so that was really cool. That was a fun day of probably my most fun day going out Bigfooting. And if I can keep going here, uh, I would like to add, I didn't find out about this until just this past summer, back in July. I read a BFRO report where someone reported seeing a Bigfoot two days, exactly two days after we were there and saw those tracks. And it is on the BFRO website. Wow. So I think that's really neat that yeah, that possibly could have been the creature that the, the footprints we saw and then someone two days later a dog walker saw a bigfoot and the power line cut out at the back of the park where we were just there and they saw something two days later and it's on the bfro website wow that's a little uh, it's quite a bit of validation uh, yeah for yeah it really is mm-hmm. um, so I would def- go ahead i was just gonna say uh, a couple things uh People, uh, skeptics especially, always question, well, how come you only find one or two tracks? But as you just said, actually trackways are found. Not on a regular basis, but some people have found a string of tracks. Like you were saying, you you guys tracked them for a long ways. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. and people question the size of the tracks, you know. Well, obviously, that's within the human range. Yes. However, we all know they're not born full grown, <laughs> you know. Right. Uh, your foot grows as you get older, and we assume that their foot would do the same. I don't think an infant's going to be born with an 18-inch foot. And I also believe that the smaller the foot the easier it is to make an impression with that foot because of the weight distribution. So actually a creature that has a huge foot isn't going to leave as many tracks on different surfaces as a creature with a 10 and a half inch foot. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I never really had thought about it like that, but yeah, I would. Um, that's a good point that you're making that that makes sense. The other thing is the wood knocks, uh, I, I've heard people use different things. They even sell, like, basically the equivalent of a miniature baseball bat, you know, that you can yeah. just whack the side of a tree with. It's interesting mm-hmm. that you use the music instrument, the percussion instrument. I remember uh, using those as a kid in music class. Yeah, uh, yeah, the claw bass. Um Yeah, I like those because I, I just put them in my backpack. They're, they're, half, they're pretty tiny. They fit in the backpack easily. And I mean, I can be anywhere and I don't need a tree. I just can be anywhere I want and just find a spot and click those, click those claw bays together. And usually can get a pretty good, pretty good echo with them and uh, a good sound and they can carry a little ways. Another thing that I see question a lot is the wood knocks. Um, How do you know it wasn't a person? Uh, What's your answer to that? Well, like in our particular case at the uh, Stinchcomb Wildlife Refuge, 
our par- our our cars were the only cars in the parking lot that day. Like nobody else, there was that was not a popular day to go dog walking or or anything like that. So we were like the only crazy people out there at Stinchcomb that day. Like actually just walking trails. Now on the flip side of that, there are probably homeless people that are out there sometimes and kind of camping out or whatever. Um, I know that kind of hap- that kind of thing happens out there a little bit, but. Um, and I'll say I know it wasn't a woodpecker because this was just a single knock. And as far as I know, woodpeckers don't just do one single knock. And it was every time. Um, a hoaxer or just another person. Um, you know, have you ever just tried to... I mean, you have to find the right kind of tree and you have to have the right kind of branch. And you have to hit it just right in the sweet spot to get a good knock. Yeah. And these were... I mean, these knocks sounded good uh, to the naked ear. Um you have to kind of kind of know what you're doing. You can't just be someone just hit a tree. It's not just it's not gonna have that great sound if you don't know like what you're doing. So that's like the best answer I can come up with. But that day, I mean, nobody was there. There's just no way. Another thing that I find interesting that you know I hear from other researchers was the amount of time that passed where you heard the response. If you go outside your house and clap your hands loudly or bang on something, I find it hard to believe that you're going to hear somebody respond to you to begin with, with the same sound as a human. Secondly, a human, I would think, would respond instantly to it, not wait, you know, 30 seconds or an hour or whatever to return the same sound it to me that just never made sense you know and kind of rules out the human theory to it right and another thing i'll add to that when when i did the first wood knock at the back of the park before we made our way back we walked like 10 minutes or 15 minutes coming back and I mean, like I said, we were talking loudly. We weren't trying to be quiet. We we're on our way out. We're, we had a good day, blah, 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 blah. And then we heard that wood knock. So it was, it was a good amount of time. And we kind of interpreted that as maybe like they're kind of, they kind of followed us out of the park kind of, and they kind of knew we were on our way back to the parking lot. Maybe it was like a signal. Maybe they're, they're leaving, you know, or something like all clear or something. We kind of interpreted that as a possibility. The reason I like Stenchcomb stories, and I've covered this with Evans before, um, Stenchcomb was actually on an episode of Finding Bigfoot, right? That's correct. Uh, I think it was season three, episode three. Stenchcomb, I mean, it's right next to a major metropolitan area. I mean, Oklahoma City has like a population of over a million people in the metro area. And stenchcomb is just right there like if you're a just a bigfoot enthusiast and you didn't know better and you're looking on a map or something you'd say there's no way that there's bigfoot there but do you find a lot of reports coming from situations like that where it's in areas you would never imagine bigfoot being or close to you know a large population of people yeah so that's a good question um I, I kind of did an episode on this on my YouTube channel, the same topic. I, and that, and the whole the whole idea was, are there any other areas in America that are stinchcomb like, meaning they're right up against they're right up against the, like city limits, basically so close to a metropolitan area, like like a like a wildlife refuge type place. And so I, you know, I didn't really investigate it too hard. I just did a quick Google search. And I found an article that I liked for my for the format of my show, and it was an article that outlined like I think it was like ten major cities that have like really close hunting nearby, hunt, like public hunting land nearby. So I went with that, and and I went down the list, and I found uh, there there are you can there is hunting land within like an hour drive of major cities all across the U.S. and Come to find out, probably the one that I thought was the most stinchcomb like, just from my, just based off the article I read. There might be, a, there, there's probably so many others out there that I don't even know about, but the one that I came up with was St. Louis, because 
it has several like wildlife refuge type things around the city and it has the element of the river uh and i and i went to the bfro site and i actually found a a sighting where these people were fishing at they're in a, either in a boat or tubing or something in the Missouri River, and they they saw a Bigfoot uh, on the bank from from them being in the water. They saw Bigfoot on the bank, and so that you know that's around St. Louis, and so I thought that was my my conclusion was St. Louis was the most stenchcomb like out of the whole United States. That's what I said on the episode, but you know listeners might you know write in and tell us some better better spots than that. And St. Louis is huge. Yeah. Uh, very densely populated. And all the surrounding areas of St. Louis are densely populated. That's really mm-hmm. interesting. Um, you just did an investigation on the water, didn't you, from uh, Lake Habern? Yeah, that's, that's true. Yes. Um, me and Brian Terrell, he's he's now with our, with our organization, No Bro. And he also does his own thing in Northwest Oklahoma. He came he came down to Hayburn Lake here in Oklahoma, just not very far from Tulsa. It's like an hour drive from my house, super close. And uh, we had a we had an eyewitness who had a boat, and he took us out on the water, and and uh, he heard like some really loud crashing sounds uh, back in this kind of wooded area. He was he was on the water in his boat with his family one day. I think it was back in December. And I think he said it was a pretty warm day before it really got started to get cold. And but he heard some like loud footsteps <clears throat> crashing through branches, type of thing, Le- leaves like crunching. And he just thought it sounded like something super big back in there. And and so we went back in that same spot and looked around a little bit. Didn't didn't find anything real real interesting. Uh, since that video came out, that eyewitness sent in a uh, picture of like a a tree a branch twist on a tree like in a spot where you know you can't get there unless you go there by boat um so that was kind of interesting that he found that too like a a cool branch twist something actually twisted the branch in the video (laughs) yes there's a a part where you're on the water Mm -hmm. and you're going by a boat ramp um, okay. I don't know if you remember this or not. Now, I can't be for certain because it's been years and years ago. Uh, but that boat ramp really looks like the same boat ramp where I parked whenever I did a short investigation of the area back in like 2000. Uh, okay. I had a friend who lived and grew up in Kellyville, right by Habern Lake. Mm -hmm. And he had been out there, and I believe he was fishing or swimming, uh, and he had seen some stuff. He went walking around through the woods over there. There's a little cove next to this particular boat ramp. And he said on the other side of the cove, he found several trees... Uh, just small trees with rocks larged in the forks of the limbs around the trunk. And you just could not explain it. They weren't real high up off the ground or anything, and they weren't like huge rocks, but why would somebody walk over there and carry some rocks with them to lodge into the forks of these trees? And he also had seen something, but at the time, I didn't think anything about Bigfoot. It just wasn't on my radar for this particular story. He said that he saw something large in the water surface above the, about 20 feet away from him. I think, um, very close. Uh, and he described it. I was like, okay, well, was it a turtle or, you know, a fish or what are you talking about? And he said, no, it it was way too big to be a turtle or anything like that. And he said, it looked like the top of somebody's head, like covered in like stringy brown moss. And it just slowly broke the surface and then went back under. And he hauled butt out of there. Now, fast forward to modern times. (laughs) I'm thinking, well, could that moss have been 
hair and could that have been the top of something's head uh i mean i hope it wasn't like a dead body bobbing around or anything (laughs) but you uh, you know back then i didn't think to attach bigfoot to water like that especially underwater but you do hear a lot of reports about them swimming and being in water what's your take on that do you think they'll swim around underwater and stuff um yeah so let's see here i'm I'm gonna go back to monster quest to an episode where they did what was that called uh oh the island that uh dr bendernagel lives on I'm trying yeah. to think of, it's up in canada yeah uh they Vancouver monster quest did, yes and on that episode they you know they uh had documented or they had footage of like bears could actually make that trek and swim from the mainland over to the island, I think. I'm trying to remember. I yeah. think I'm right. And, you know, there's there are some some people that have, you know, said that apes can swim. So, I, yes, I think it's possible that they, they could swim and go underwater. And this actually reminds me of something else uh, that has to do with Evans. He took a report for us for NOBRO. I think it was Lake Ten Killer. And this witness actually had photographs, kind of the same thing. It was like a like a head shape coming up out of the water. And we actually have some photographs of it. Um, you know, we've had, we've had both positive feedback and, and negative feedback. You know how it goes when you post a picture yeah. and how people are. But, but uh, I mean, the eyewitness was scared and they got out of there. Like they took a couple of pictures and got out of there. They didn't want to get any closer. And they, they believe that it was a Bigfoot that they saw. And we have that in our database and we have the picture, uh, the pictures in the database. So, yeah, that that's interesting. It's kind of the same thing. Um, and and I like how you're saying it looked like they said it looked like moss or something. But yeah, it could have been hair or or it, they could have put moss on on purpose. You know? <laughs> yeah. To camouflage. You, you it's interesting. Know. You don't know. Interesting idea. Um, what's one of your favorite reports that you've taken as a researcher? Favorite reports. Oh, man. Um, well, there's been a lot of them. I'll go ahead and, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and just say it was a lot of fun. We, the most, one of the most recent reports I did, and it was a lot of fun. And this could be controversial too. Um, but it was the Chandler Park track. And I, I, I think you know about it. Yeah. But somebody, somebody, um, somebody, uh, and a park naturalist at Chandler Park in Tulsa. She here's here's the story or the here's the setup. She she gives out a weekly hike once a month, or, or I said a weekly hike. She gives out a hike like once or twice. I think it's twice a month. She does a hike, a guided hike on Saturdays, and so she she does prep work like for those hikes. She goes out during the week on like a, on a day during the week, and she she goes and looks around to see if there's anything happens to be interesting on along the, the trail that they're going to go on the hike and like she can point out on her guided hike. So she has some material to talk about. So, you know, she might, you know, find scat or something or here and there or, or whatever. Well, this, this particular day, she found a human looking track that was very, very big. And, uh, they, she photographed it, put it on their Chandler park, Facebook page. We got in contact with her asked if we could come out and she could show us where it was. And so I went out there and, and took the measurements. It was around 17 inches long, about seven inches wide. Uh, and you know, we and we ended up, we ended up going out there and casting it uh, on, on the Saturday of our guided hike. And that kind of became part of the hike and the whole experience for the people that showed up. And, and we actually have the cast of it now. And uh, it's in the possession of one of our, in our NOBRO guys, and he, I recently got to like see the final product, and actually hold it in my hand, and actually have it on a different video. But we think it has both really unique features where it could be legit, and then there's some other things that are wrong with the track. Like an- one thing that's wrong with it is she had good intentions. The park naturalist, she she was trying to use it as educational purposes, but she she stuck her boot in the track, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so like. <laughs> So like that, that like and ro- she's a naturalist. The- yes, <laughs> like she should know better. Yeah, yeah, I know. And her heart was in the right place because she was like trying to show the kids, and she was trying to you know show the size and all that. 
but she should have done it beside beside the track. Um, and she was also trying to show like which direction it was pointed, like and it was kind of going over to to a tree line this way and that kind of thing. So anyway, that has that that problem with it. And then uh, we think the big toe and then like the pinky toe, they look pretty legit. But then like the three digits, um, we think maybe somebody kind of used their finger and uh, kind of either were pointing pointing out the toes there or they kind of maybe smudged the toes and that's and then we don't know if those are quite natural in the three the three in the middle so so we we do admit like there's some really good things about the track the length is awesome 17 inches the width seven inches that's pretty nice um because we we go by you know a legitimate track should be about the width should be about half of the length Mm -hmm. and so that's not exactly the the half of the length, but it's, it's close enough in the range that, you know, it, um, it's, it's interesting. And I even had like some people write into me and say, Hey, that track, you know, I, I have 15 inch feet. I have 17 inch feet. That could just have been me. And I'm like, I, I understand that, sir. And yes, sir. But do you know the width of your foot? And like, Oh no, I don't know the width of my foot. Do you think it's seven inches? Well, I don't know. That's a good point. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, you know, I mean, yeah, it could be a person, but, and all these people are like writing in, yeah, I have that long of feet, not big of feet, but they're not thinking about the width part of it. So that's something that you need to take into account as well. I mean, obviously if it was made by a human, it was a deliberate hoax of some kind. Right. Uh, just messing with people for a width like that. I mean, I've seen pictures of the track, you know, it was in the local media here. Yeah. Um, What's interesting about it, though, so I did talk to Evans about this, honestly. The local parks have used Bigfoot in the past for promotion Mm -hmm. here in Tulsa. Uh, Right. Most recent before that was uh, the Turkey Mountain hiking area. Correct. And they posted several photos of a guy wearing, I believe, the same costume you own. Um, Mm -hmm. However, they came clean, you know. Uh, right. Where people got a little too interested and too hyped up over it. They're like, you know, it's just a promotion, blah, blah, blah. Uh, years before that, somebody had emailed me about a Channel 8 news story where they had somebody on there reporting a Bigfoot sighting, and it sounded really legit, and they saw it along the Arkansas River. And I reached out to Channel 8 News, and it took a while and some persistence, but finally they answered back, and they're like, yeah, we aired that story on April 1st as an April Fool's joke. We didn't think anybody would actually believe it. Bigfoot's not real. You know, oh, oh my that's God. the general view of everybody in the media. Um, right. But in this situation, I would assume that an employee of the park, the naturalist or whatever, would have come clean to you if they were behind it and just using it for promotion. Right. No, I... You know, I met her and talked with her, and she seemed like a really sweet, genuine person. I I just really, in my opinion, I don't feel like that's what happened here. I really don't. Um, and she, she even said, "I, you know, I think it's, I think this is probably a human footprint, but it, it's just really big and it was interesting. And and so I, you know, took a picture of it. And and uh, so anyway, I I don't I don't think that's what happened here as a, a, a big time publicity stunt well my hat goes off to you as a researcher you did your due diligence and actually investigated which a lot of researchers don't do right well thank you um appreciate that yeah i mean i thought it was it's not too far from my house um i'm not like it's not putting me out really that that bad or anything so i i went out there and just wanted to take a look at it in person and it actually was like more impressive looking at it being there looking at it in real life and just seeing the pictures. Um, and, and our, our official stance of NOBRO is it's inconclusive. You know, we're not saying that is a Bigfoot track, and, but we're not going to say it's not like it's got some interesting characteristics to it. I know, uh, confidentiality is important in the research community whenever it comes to eyewitnesses protecting their identity and everything. Um, and I know that your particular organization is a group that is very 
positive and stays out of the drama. You don't get involved in internet stuff. But is there a report that you've ever had where you were just like, there's no way, or this person is obviously lying? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So sometimes we'll, we'll get people that, uh, that ride in and they, you know, they tell us, Hey, I heard a sound or I think they're around our property, yada, yada, yada. And so, you know, we, we're taking them serious and, and, um, I'll, I'll kind of start organizing. Hey, is it okay if we bring some guys out and look around? And at first they're like, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll organize it and I'll set, I'll get everybody all coordinated and I'll come back and write them write them another email and be like, Hey, can we come this day at this time? It'll be like a group of three or four of us. And then they don't respond. And I'm like, why don't, why, why did they not respond at all? And so I've had some conversations with, with some of our guys and they said, you know, um, sometimes people just get cold feet at the last second. And sometimes it was just people playing a prank on us in the first place. Like that's what they found over the years is sometimes there's just people like, just pranking us and writing in just to, I don't know, get us like all involved and then ha ha, you know? So, you know, that could have been some of that. Um, Oh, I took, I took a report or I, I, I read a report off of a, a Facebook group, another Bigfoot Facebook group in another state. And I went ahead and took his report and cataloged it, but his report was kind of, Oh, it was kind of weird to me. I'm trying to remember the specifics of it. It was like, uh, oh, I think a trail cam took a picture. And then on the picture, I don't really see anything at all uh, in the picture. But, you know, he kind of said a Bigfoot was on there. And I, I just can't, I just can't see anything at all. It just looks like a, just a dark, dark picture of nothing. So I kind of like, that's the one instance that I can think of where uh, I just wasn't really seeing what he was seeing. <laughs> There's uh, just today. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. I just can't help myself. I, I try my best to keep my mouth shut and just stay out of things, but sometimes it's hard. Um, okay. <laughs> there, there is a, a group of photos being passed around and posted in different, you know, Facebook pages and stuff. And, you know, it's uh, one of those f sets of photos or a photo that it seems like every year. It yes. resurfaces with a new story behind it and everything. And here's I know exactly over a hundred comments of people that are believing everything, you know, and think that it's brand new information. Right. Uh, and then you try to explain to them or educate them on the origin without being too negative. Mm -hmm. And you get attacked for it. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> why do you think people not only feel so strongly about it, but what interests people, just the general public and Bigfoot in the first place? Like why are so many people interested in the topic? Why are so many people interested in the topic? Well, um, I like, I know what you're talking about. The res the recirculating pictures. I've kind of been on the other end of that. Like when I first got into it and I think it was the exact same ones that you're talking about that are resurfacing right now. And this was probably like eight years ago. I saw these pictures and uh, somebody, somebody uh, said like in my local town, Hey, look there, look what somebody took a picture of this uh, at our local lake. And so I kind of reposted it. And then somebody else that's researched way longer than I, I did or have, they said, no, these, this isn't real. This is, you know, this has happened before. I was like, Oh, okay. So I, I took it down. I felt bad uh, and I felt kind of, I've been there. So I felt kind of oh, stupid <laughs> because I didn't know any better because I was just getting into it. So I'm kind of, I guess I'm kind of speaking for people who are just getting into it and seeing these. Um, but yeah, they, but if you tell them, like you're saying, if you try to educate them and try to do it the right way, you know, nowadays people are get defensive and get their feelings hurt, I guess. Uh, but at the time I felt, Oh man, I feel so dumb right now. Well, I, I took it down and, but the way the person came at me was, well, they just didn't word it real, real nice, but, but I took it down and I, you know, I didn't want to spread fault. I definitely don't want to be a person who spreads false information. So, so I took it down and, uh, felt bad about it. 
Well, I sincerely hope it wasn't me. No, no, it was not. It was not. <laughs> this was somebody else. This was somebody else who, who I know who they are. <laughs> what does your uh, family and friends outside of the Bigfoot world think about your uh, interest? So, like, my four-year-old son thinks it's awesome. He loves Bigfoot with me, and, you know, he'll if I have a show on TV, he'll be like, daddy, is that Bigfoot? Are you watching Bigfoot? Yes. And so he'll kind of want to watch it uh, with me for a while. And he loves it. And I think he's already ready to go out on a camp out with me. So when he's old enough, he's definitely going to start going with me. Uh, my daughter, my youngest daughter, she thinks it's cool. She likes to draw Bigfoot with me. She's kind of an artist. So she'll draw Bigfoot with me. She kind of thinks it's cool, but then there's times where she's like, dad, Bigfoot's not real. <laughs> <laughs> And then my, my oldest daughter, um, she's a teenager, and uh, I sent her a TikTok video that I made of, of, a, of the Patterson-Gimlin film, and I sent it to her, and I asked her about, I was like, did you get that video? And she's like, I wrote on there that I am not interested in getting vi- Bigfoot videos. <laughs> <laughs> so, typical so, teenager. <laughs> yeah, so she was, like, not into it. My wife's very, very supportive. Um, she's open to hearing um you know, information that leads to make someone believe there's Bigfoot, but she's not there like, you know, full force. I, you know, I'm a Bigfoot believer, but she's definitely supportive and lets me go out on these weekends when, when I can, when it doesn't interfere with family activities. Uh, friends outside, uh, coworkers, uh, most of my coworkers know, and they think it's pretty cool. And um, no one's ever approaches me and is just mean and like says negative things to me. They all, for the most part, think it's pretty cool and it's it's all right. Uh, but I do on Facebook. I try, and that's kind of like why Squatch Ranger is kind of nice. My Facebook Squatch Ranger page, because I that I, I put everything Bigfoot. I just post on there. I don't post on my personal name account in Facebook. So I try to keep like Bigfoot stuff out of my, my newsfeed. It's just all in Squatch Ranger. And so like, if I have friends that aren't following Squatch Ranger, Squatch Ranger, they're not going to see that and not get upset or think I'm some big lunatic or something like that. So that's a nice way to separate it. How do you explain to your kids, uh, what Bigfoot is? Have they asked you that question? Because I know that I've got a couple of stepkids who are older now, but uh, they've pretty much been with me since they were really young. And they figured out at a pretty early rate that something's going on with this whole Bigfoot thing. <laughs> you know, why does Matt have all this Bigfoot stuff? And he's always talking yeah. about it. And uh-huh. it was kind of difficult for me to explain to them, you know, what it was and why I think it's real and all the questions that come. So how did you handle that situation? Yeah, so, like, when my daughter, my youngest daughter, she's like, Dad, Bigfoot's not real. Like, she'll say that to me every once in a while. And, you know, I say, well, I have friends who have seen one. They say they've seen one, and I believe them. They they definitely saw something. So there is something going on. Um, I mean, these are close people that I know. They've seen one. So I'm, I'm going off of that. That's how I approach it to her. And, you know... Um, what what exactly it is well we're we're still looking into that and we're trying to find out get to the bottom of it that's why i like it so much (laughs) what do you think the strongest evidence is out there that these things are real well the strongest evidence i guess would be i guess the casts uh, the cast the footprints um I, i mean i love the patterson gimlin film and i love um I think his name's Bill Munns. Mm-hmm. I love listening to Bill Munns break down the Patterson Gimlin film because he's like, he's like, oh man, he is like so. How do I explain this? He's so thorough, and like his explanations are like so thorough, and like there's there's no like stone unturned when he's explaining stuff, and he breaks it down so good. And he's like a Hollywood. He was a Hollywood makeup artist. And, you know, it's it's got him convinced that, that there's no way someone could make a costume like that. So so I like that. I love listening to Bill Munns. I love the, the, the tracks and the cast. But probably my favorite part of it that I get into, I just love hearing people that actually saw one. I love hearing them talk about it and how it happened and how it went down. So eyewitness accounts. I 100% agree with you. 
And I remember when Bill Munns was putting together his uh, analysis and report on the Patterson footage um, and used to talk to him frequently while he was doing that. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, you mentioned Bill Munns was a Hollywood effects guy. He wasn't just any Hollywood effects guy, though. He was one of the big names. Uh, he actually created the costume for the Swamp Thing uh, movie, I think, or television series. I think it was the television series, um, which is an amazing costume that still like holds up to today. Uh, all practical effects, no CG stuff. And a very intelligent man and has spent uncountable hours researching everything every aspect of the patterson footage so if you can get an opportunity to read his analysis or listen to it on a podcast or something you should absolutely do so um in my humble opinion <laughs> I, I I agree, and there's there's a video out there. Uh, one of his presentations, it's so cool. He like has a 3D model like like of like the guys on the horseback and like where Patty was, and like he he does this 3D recreation of how Patterson jumped off the horse and like at frame, you know X Y Z. He turned off the camera for five seconds, and then at frame or he turned it right back on after five seconds, and then frames la la la. It's like. Like he, he goes down and breaks it down frame by frame. Like it's, it's like too much information that he's giving you about it. But it, I mean, it's, I love it. And I love to listen to him talk about it. He even tracked down all the possible materials that were used by professional costume makers at the time of the Patterson footage and explains like why it's not this, why it's not this, why it's not this, what it would take, like how much money it would have taken. Um, and nobody at the time would have been capable. I mean, the closest thing that they have is Planet of the Apes. And even then, I mean, Planet of the Apes is just masks and, like, some sleeves, basically, and gloves and boots. Like, it's nothing like a full-body costume with muscle articulation and things. Um, very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Very. And hey, another video, you're you're bringing back my memory here. One of my first videos that I did was I took my $100 just general Bigfoot suit that anybody can get. And I and I put it on. I tried to kind of recreate the Patterson Game 1 walk. So I kind of tried to do a side-by-side -side of both videos of Patty and then me. And my whole point on my video was, okay, and I think it was like 2017 at the time when I did this. So my whole point was, 2017 technology of making a costume, even if it's just to the general public, you would think would be better material and look better than the material if it was a costume in right. 1967. It was, should look better than a 1967 costume, whatever they came up with then. But no, my costume in 2017 has like folds in it and wrinkles and and uh, like me trying to do the walk. I'm, I'm doing the best I can, but it still isn't quite as fluid as patty so so uh, that was one of, that was a pretty good video um it got quite a few views and uh, i thought it was kind of a cool way to go about it what equipment do you take with you whenever you go out me i just take a, a sony video camera that i got at walmart it's nothing fancy um i have i have a couple of different night visions i got some binoculars some bino x binoculars i have night vision uh, I have a little night 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 vision monocular. Um, of course, I take the claves. I take I take audio recorders. I, I have a I do have a trail cam. I'd like to get I like to use it more. I've only used it once. I'd like to use the audio recorders more, the trail cam more. I'd like to do more stuff like that. But yeah, just your your basic stuff like that. If somebody was wanting to go out and look for Bigfoot, uh, what advice would you give them on choosing like a location? Oh man, that's a great question. So, I mean, um, I would say, you know, find, find like a wild management area in like close to your, close to your, um, wherever you live. Uh, someone once said, 
Um, you know, if you if you take a map of Oklahoma and throw a dart at it, <laughs> uh, pretty much anywhere it lands, you're going to have Bigfoot reports from around Oklahoma. That's that's pretty true, except when you're getting out in the Panhandle and Northwest Oklahoma's. It does have some sighting reports, but not as much as you know Eastern Oklahoma, definitely. But uh, I would say just go to a wildlife management area uh, close to, to wherever you live. Go to south southeast Oklahoma. I mean, you can't go wrong. Go to eastern Oklahoma, any any place. I mean, there's so many squatchy areas. Uh, but go somewhere close and just like you know, make set up a base camp. Just sit around. Uh, just talk. Just be natural. And if if something's going to come up and close to you it will if, if it doesn't it doesn't just just camp out a, a, a good way i like to look at it is go camping bigfoot's just an extension of your camping though like just go camping enjoy the outdoors bigfoot's just an addition to that the bigfooting part so like you know be natural like they want to come in and look at you and investigate you see what you're doing in your natural state not if you're running around with binoculars and cameras and stuff like that Excellent advice. Thank you. Um, let's change up speeds for a minute. All right. Uh, no disrespect intended. Okay. Uh, the woo, <laughs> as it's known in the Bigfoot community. Uh, the belief and reports of Bigfoot being paranormal. Do you think that's a possibility? Yeah, so the way that I, I answer this is, um, for me right now, I like to just, I like to follow the evidence that we have and base, like, what what we have in front of us right now, like, to what, to what Bigfoot is. Now, if we come forward later and get more evidence of that kind of thing, actual evidence, like, where we can measure it or see it or whatever, then I'm willing to go there. I'm, I'm, I'm not... I don't want to be closed-minded to that, but I'm not ready to go there yet. So, just for me. I'm just speaking for me personally. And I would never, like, disrespect someone that, that thinks along those lines. Um, you know, like, there's people about that think Bigfoot has to do with UFOs. You know, that actually makes sense. That actually would make sense why we can't find a Bigfoot. Like, like, like you were saying earlier, like, people find two or three tracks or, or one track. Like, where did the Bigfoot go? Well, you were talking about, like, distribution of the weight. But, you know, maybe it maybe it teleported up into a UFO. And that's, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not willing to go there yet. But that actually does make sense, like, why we can't find it. Why we would just find one track and all of a sudden, boom, it's not there. Um, so I don't want to laugh at people that think that. And I, I definitely don't want to be disrespectful because what I think and what you think, I mean – you know, who am I? I'm just right. another guy. So, like, I just want to follow the evidence that we have right now. And if, we, if it goes there, it goes there. And I'm ready. I'm ready to go there with it. So that's that's how I look at it. What do you think about all the reports uh, of people seeing orbs? Because there is some evidence out there, uh, photos and video taken of people seeing strange lights out in the woods. But they tend to connect them to Bigfoot. Do you think there's a connection or how do you explain those? Yeah, um, maybe there could be a connection. I've actually been in southeast Oklahoma, um, and I've actually seen what some of us in the group thought was eye shine. I was in Honubi on an expedition. I saw these two, like, whitish, kind of white light, but they kind of have a blue blue tint to them. And uh, they were kind of moving in a way that could have looked like swaying. This was, like, in complete darkness. So these lights were moving, like, like they could have been swaying back and forth. Like people say Bigfoot sways back and forth behind a tree or something or holds a tree and sways. It would be consistent with that. So in that instance, maybe it was Bigfoot related. I, I'm not ready to say it was a, a Bigfoot or Bigfoot eye shine because I didn't see the outline, but I did see the lights. Um, recently, I just went on a trip a couple weekends ago and I went to Southeast Oklahoma around, I'll say antlers and uh, we were at this private property, and we saw that 
a couple of guys saw three sets of eye shines. I only saw two sets. I didn't see the third. But I saw lights very similar to what I saw in Honubi um, a few years back. And, you know, I don't know what to think of that. Like, that, that's, that's got me. Like, you know, there's people, there's guys that were there that think that's a Bigfoot eye shine. And I am totally open to that. But I'm not ready to say that publicly until I, like, you know, see it, like, actually see the Bigfoot. But I definitely saw the lights in the woods, like, and there shouldn't have been lights there. It wasn't car lights. It wasn't, we saw where the, the cabins and stuff were back a different direction. We saw the cabin lights. It wasn't that. And these were moving around, which appeared to be 30 yards away. And then a couple of other people in our party, they, they actually did see, like, an outline of a, of a body and, like, cross the road. So, so um, the orbs, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, actually, I actually caught an orb on my uh, doorbell camera uh, a, couple of, a couple of weeks ago at my, at my house. Uh, some uh, This light, floating light, this orb triggered the camera to turn on, and it floated across. You can just see on our front porch and then disappears. And my wife, I, I wouldn't even have known about it. But my wife's like, hey, look what the camera caught. She sent me the screenshot of it. And I shared it with our group. And um, so I'm all for, you know, I, I yeah, there are orbs. I, I saw one on my front porch, of orbs of light. That orb on my front porch, I do not believe was Bigfoot. But, <laughs> but who, do I, know. who am I to say that? <laughs> yeah. Who am I to say that orbs in the forest aren't Bigfoot related? Uh, another big one is cloaking. Uh the idea that Bigfoot can turn itself invisible, and that's why it hides so easily from us. Do you have an explanation? Do you believe that that's a possibility, or could there be a different explanation for it? Yeah, so the best one I've heard is from one of my friends in our group. Uh, i trying to remember where he heard it from. But I guess, like, the the color of their hair can, like, go clear or something, or what was the explanation? I think it was like their hair can be clear colored or something and that can kind of they and so they're able to like camouflage better and maybe that's that's kind of a explanation of the cloaking um i, I kind of like that explanation i'm not explaining it back very well um i wish i could reach uh, phone a friend <laughs> i wish i could phone my friend and ask him what what it was but i, I like that one um it seems so like I, somewhere uh, i read that polar bear's hair is clear yeah, yeah, or semi-translucent and, of some kind. Yeah, yeah, and that's kind of what the what what he was telling me, and um, I, you know, I can go along with that. Like, maybe that, you know, maybe that does help them like camouflage and look, you know, look like they're cloaking in a sense. What are your thoughts on the dog man phenomenon? Oh, the dog man. Um, I stay away from that. Um, I, you know, I. I told you earlier, I love mysteries and I love this and that when I was a teenager. Um, yeah, I've narrowed it down to Bigfoot. I really, I love Bigfoot. Everything's Bigfoot for me. Um, I, I, what I've learned is dog, dog man is evil. It's just evil stuff. Stay away from it. Like it's so evil. Like don't even speak about it. Like that's, that's, you know, information I've been told. Um, it's fascinating. I definitely, I do not want to find a dog man in the woods. I want to find Bigfoot. <laughs> dog man sounds way scarier. I do not want anything to do with dog man. What do you think of dog man? You know, I don't know. I used to be a hard advocate of no way. There's no such thing. Um, whenever I first started getting into Bigfoot on a serious basis, reports would come out about once every several years somebody would have a sighting but it was always described as like a bigfoot except it kind of had a protruding snout area instead of just a flat face but never anything with pointed ears and claws and you know legs that were canine or leaving behind giant paw prints or anything like that um however outside of bigfoot those Canine reports, uh, which were generally in folklore as werewolves, basically, um, mm. were the second most reported thing for people to see uh, outside of like ghosts and UFOs. We're talking just in the cryptid world. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that I found early on. But now, fast forward, 
now I'm in that position I was in before uh, my Bigfoot stuff where I've talked to people that I trust that I believe are telling the truth who claim to have seen things, who claim to have found evidence. So I don't really know what to think about it anymore. Um, I'm kind of like you. I don't want to find one. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, if Bigfoot's not supernatural in any way, then it's a primate of some kind. It has the same characteristics as a primate. And primates, for the most part, uh, aren't going to eat a human. Whereas a werewolf <laughs> or a dogman is definitely a predator. And that... Yeah. Uh, physical design is designed to hunt down and kill things and it's going to be a meat eater so i could be on the menu and yeah i'm not game for that <laughs> yeah i hear all. you so uh like you I, it's just something i'd rather leave alone and also like you uh, there's a lot of uh native american influence in my beliefs uh coming from oklahoma and everything and dogmen type entities and the lucifer is a common name that's not something you go messing with you just leave that alone right and uh i've been to the honubi bigfoot festival and conference and a few years back there was there's some people that live out in western oklahoma and from my understanding i mean they're seeing them in western oklahoma some dogmen and then another guy in our in our group he he really thinks that he saw a dogman i think twice um, just driving like road roadside encounter type thing. Like he thought he saw a dog bigger than your average dog. I mean, huge. So, you know, they could be out there. They could be, you never know. Um, mm -hmm. have you had any experiences or encounters with something outside of the orbs and the Bigfoot stuff like ghosts or UFOs or anything? No, I'm I'm so uninteresting. No, I haven't. Um, I wish I, I wish I had more interesting tales, but no, not out, not outside of that stuff. Well, I think your tales are interesting. I, I don't <laughs> I don't think you give yourself enough credit. I think you're a very humble guy uh, that deserves more attention, which is why I wanted to have you on the show to begin with. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. No, I don't have any more um, exciting tales like that. Um, I told you about the the eye shine in southeast Oklahoma and then yeah, antlers. I'm trying to think if there's we went over the stench comb. That like that was my favorite Bigfoot Bigfooting day of all. Um other than that, I mean just just going out there and being with my friends, uh I don't I I'm, I'm still waiting to see one. <laughs> I, like I told you earlier, I've not seen one yet. Uh there's a couple other people in our group that have not seen one yet and we are we are like we're all out. Like we want to, we want to see one, and we go out on campouts in the fall and in the spring, and and uh, we got we got a guy in our group that uh, he has a um, oh a special night vision that we put on top of his car. We drive around back roads, like I mean, we go back in the backwoods and we we scan the you know the roadside on each side with his camera, and we're still waiting to see one. So at this point, uh, what do you think Bigfoot is, and are you convinced that they're real? Yeah, I, I think they are real because there's just there's just so many people that say they've seen one, and I love how somebody else put it. Like out of the thousands and thousands of reports over the hundreds of years or thousands of years of reports – and the folklore and stuff like it just takes one person to be telling the truth and it's real. <laughs> like, uh, like all, all over the years, like if everybody is lying or they misidentified what they saw over the, like all the reports and everything we've been hearing, it just takes the one person to be telling the truth and it's real. So, so I do, I do think it's real. Um, what do I think it is? Um, I'm going to go by the stance of our organization in OBRO um, and this is controversial and I'm, yeah, and I know that, um, but, um, I'm going to the Sasquatch genome project. Uh, I, I was not involved with that, but I'm in the organization. And so I'm, I'm being a good organization member and, and, um, they, 
they got they got it all the way to uh, Zoo Bank, Zoo Bank, and uh, they actually have a name for it, which is Homo sapien cognatus, which means blood relative. So it's some kind of a blood relative to a human uh, that had some kind of a like it's half it's half ape half human basically, and it has some human DNA in it. So that's the best answer I got for you. Whenever they write the book of Ryan White after you're gone, <laughs> what do you want the accomplishment to be? What, what what's your goal in all of this? Um, just that you know, I was a, a hard worker. I worked hard at what I was trying to do, and you know, you know, if we found Bigfoot or if we didn't find Bigfoot, I definitely um, went out trying. Um, and and that's not just in Bigfoot, just in everything that that Ryan White just, you know, worked hard and did what he was supposed to do and and uh, cared about the people around him. One final question. Okay. <laughs> uh, are you an advocate of these things being federally protected? Um, yeah, I guess so. That's, that's a great question. I've never really, really thought about what my answer would be for something like that. But, yeah, I definitely would want them to be protected. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't want them to go extinct. And if there's not, not, not that many of them out there, we definitely need to protect them and not just go out and kill them. So yeah, I, I guess I would be for that. Yes, definite. Yes. Marking you down as yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, thanks for coming on. Uh, why don't you tell people where they can find your YouTube channel and your organization and all that? Yeah. Thank you so much for the for the um plug right there um so i do have a youtube channel it's squatch ranger so please go there and you can watch some videos uh, i'm also a part of the native oklahoma bigfoot research organization all you have to do is in your web browser in the web bar just type no bro bigfoot.org don't type www just literally write no bro bigfoot.org it'll take you straight to our website and within that website, you can find there's a tab somewhere that says Squatch Ranger, and you can get to my website. I also have a Squatch Ranger Facebook page. And I, I just want to say thank you for letting me come on and let and you let me plug all my stuff like that. Oh, no problem. It's You know, like I told you, it's uh, been far too long to take to get you on the show. I've been meaning to reach out. I mean, a fellow Okie, just a neighbor. You live right down the road from me, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely glad to be talking to you. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, no bro is a great organization that I fully endorse. Great bunch of guys doing good research, uh, the right way in my opinion. Uh, so if you've had a sighting or an encounter in Oklahoma, uh, feel free to reach out to them. I'm sure you guys would be open to taking, uh, reports from other States as well. If you'd like to be on the show and share your own Bigfoot encounter, email me at bigfootcrossroads at gmail.com. And as always, thanks for listening to Bigfoot Crossroads. <laughs>